I think that what the Lord has impressed uh, upon me to deal with tonight goes right along with some of the things maybe that were mentioned along the testimony. And several weeks ago I said that it's been maybe three or four years since I dealt with the occult as such so that we can present an opportunity for everyone here, that is many of you at least, who've never had the opportunity to, to be taken through the steps for deliverance from occult oppression. And even though you have not knowingly been involved, you can still be involved with respect to the oppression, and we want to bring this out tonight. And of course, there's hardly a person that hasn't knowingly somehow, somewhere along the line, been involved in some form of the occult. And we've got so many new ones coming, and some of them never heard, never been taught along this line. Plus the fact that even though you've been saved, baptized in spirit, maybe you've had prayer for deliverance, maybe you have been delivered of spirits. Yet this is an area that we have to deal with specifically by itself. If you'll turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18, I want to read a few verses here with respect to just the subject of the occult and oppression that can result from it and how to be delivered from it. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 9, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. So every form of occult occultism is an abomination to God. Now, there's no way we can dress it up and glorify it and call it by other names and, and make it any less an abomination to God. I don't care what form it's in, whether it's a cult or hypnotherapy, which use, is used today by the psychiatrists and medical technicians. I don't care what we call it. It's still an abomination to God. So he says, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire, still practiced throughout the world, right in this country, fire walking, or that uses divination, any form of fortune telling, an observer of the times, um, uh, astrology, an enchanter, a uh, magician, uh, a witch, sorcerer, sorceress, a charmer. Um, this could be either be a hypnotist or um, what's the other that I want? A magic charming. A uh, consulter with familiar spirits, a medium that has a spirit guide, a wizard, psychic, a necromancer, one who through seances and so forth calls up the dead. For he says that all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect Amen. with the Lord thy God. God. And to be involved in those things is not to come into perfection. And many times, many times, people do not realize why they can't arrive at a certain level of faith or spirituality, why it is that they can't receive the Holy Spirit, or if they have, that there's no real anointing, there's no real empowering or change in their life, or there's no freedom in speaking supernaturally in another language, speaking in tongues. Uh, many times they, they don't know why these things are happening, why they're hindered, why there's such a stricture upon their life, but often, as often as not, we've found it's because of some participation or involvement in the occult. So what is the power behind uh, hypnosis and ESP? <laughs> uh, I gotta do some. Yeah. What is the power behind hypnosis, ESP, magic charming, the psychics like Gene Dixon or Edgar Casey, the Ouija board? Is it God or Satan? I wanted to get my book out because that's a, a kind of a question on the, on the cover. What is the power behind these things? Well, of course, some of us know the answer, but there are a lot of people who do not know the answer. And, uh, and so we want to show you tonight how that Satan, you see, God is is in this present day outpouring the Holy Spirit, initiating a great spiritual revival Amen. in preparation for the soon return of Christ. And Satan, 
uh, is trying to counter that by initiating his own revival. It's a revival of witchcraft and sorcery and every form of occultism. And his purpose is to get you involved, to get the human race involved, men and women everywhere, especially Christians involved in some form of the occult, innocently or otherwise, so that he can bind them and hinder them and oppress them and damage their faith. And so his, uh, uh, his methods are various, uh, 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 many, many ways in which he does this. Some are very subtle, some are not uh, uh, subtle at all. They're very obvious, the cults and that sort of thing. And the scriptures predict that in the last days there will be a great increase in demonic activity, like 1 Timothy 4, 1, Matthew 24, Revelation 12, 2 Thessalonians 2, and so on. And we're actually witnessing this in the great increase in crime and bloodshed and war and uh, fear and worry and anxiety and mental stress and physical ailments and mental diseases and racial strife and social unrest and uh, increase the great increase in the cults and false religions. We're actually seeing this great demonic flood taking place right before our eyes today. And a lot of people are getting ensnared, as I say, sometimes innocently, but it doesn't matter whether it's innocent or whether you have knowingly participated in any form of the occult. It always opens the door to oppression, some form of bondage. Now, I'd like to begin by saying that <clears throat> that whether this would affect all of you or not, it needs to be said that there are two dangerous attitudes that you can have toward this whole realm of the demonic or the occult, and that is to do as so many find it convenient and popular to do, and that's deny the reality of the demonic, our personal adversary, Satan, and uh, spell devil without a D, just call it evil, you know, in the world, uh, or, or another attitude which is dangerous, and maybe it's the most dangerous because it's affecting the church and Christians, and that's to admit to the reality of the demonic and to a personal adversary, Satan, but to think, to be naive and to think that, that he and this kingdom of darkness presents no real threat to the Christian because, well, after all, Christ... <laughs> They rationalize it. Christ overcame Satan at Calvary, and so he is a defeated foe, which he is, and which Christ did, of course. And then he presents no real threat. And I say this in love, but I have to say it. This is really the view taught by the Pentecostals, that they don't really believe in the final analysis that the devil is any real threat. And because of that, many of them, as you deal with them, as you see them, you find they're quite depressed and oppressed and need deliverance of every kind. But they do not believe that a Christian can, can be so oppressed by Satan, or especially that he can have another spirit, if he has the Holy Spirit, uh, can be by, possessed by spirits. And so as a result of this, Satan is having a field day among a lot of Pentecostals and uh, a lot of charismatics because of wrong teaching. And uh, uh, to have such an attitude, a wrong attitude, is proof itself already of a deceiving spirit at work in such a situation, in such a mind, or such a church, or such a system. Because Satan, if he can't do anything else, he will convince you that he's no threat to you because you're a Christian. But to have such an attitude, of course, is to ignore all the many, many passages of Scripture that are directed to Christians which treat this whole thing uh, to the contrary. For example, Paul says in Ephesians 6 that we're not wrestling with flesh and blood. Now, he says we are wrestling with something. Whether or not you know it, you are, dear Christian. You are wrestling with something. He says it isn't flesh and blood. He says it's the powers of darkness. He says it is the principality. These things are the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. He says not to be deceived and to put on the whole armor of God. Uh, that you might be able to stand the, withstand the devil and his wiles. And we're told in 1 Peter 5 that we as Christians should be sober and vigilant because he says our adversary goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's talking to Christians. Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 or 2 Corinthians 2 tells us not to be ignorant of Satan's devices lest he gain some advantage over us. He's talking again to Christians. He says to resist the devil, to give no place to the devil. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says that Satan appears as an angel of light, not with horns and a pitchfork and breathing fire and brimstone, but he actually comes in a form that can deceive Christians who uh, will see him as an angel of light, not as the devil or a demon as he is. And that uh, we are told, for example, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, that in the latter days some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of demons. Satan is called the prince of the power of the air, the God of this world. He's the ruler. Jesus said three times he is the ruler of this world. Now, in every case, those passages I cited you, and you can find numerous passages in the Bible, teaching of the reality of Satan and the danger he is to the people of God, every one of those passages I cited you were from the New Testament after Calvary. Ephesians 6, 1 Peter 5, for example, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's speaking to Christians after Christ has already overcome Satan and given you the victory. Amen. Yet he says you can be devoured, you can be deceived if you're not careful that Satan comes as an angel of light. So we're talking about a reality. We're not talking about uh, uh, just evil as, say, an abstraction. We're not talking about habits and addictions and psychological states and attitudes. We're talking about entities, spirits, invisible spiritual forces that you cannot see. They call it drug addiction. They'll call it alcoholism, but these are spirits that they need to be delivered from. They'll talk about uh, homosexuality. They'll talk about cancer. They've given them these names, but these are spirits that bind people. And they talk about a chronic liar, but he has a lying spirit. And so what we're dealing with tonight are what uh, are set forth in Scripture as real entities. Uh, Jesus cast out uh, deaf demons, blind demons, uh, dumb demons. He cast out spirits that would cause suicide and lust and uh, bring a person into a place of absolute obsession with some habit. Uh, we're talking about uh, personalities, just like you're a personality that has uh, temperament and appetite and uh, likes and dislikes, just like you do, which seeks to identify with your weakness or your habit uh, or your personality and hide behind that and to let the doctors and psychiatrists and the ministers and everybody give it another name and say, well, you'll have to learn to live with it or you come for enough counseling and psychiatry and we'll see if we can't dredge up enough of the problem to relieve you of it. But until you see that many times these are entities, spirits, demons uh, behind these things, uh, you'll never be free. And so when a person gets involved in any form of the occult, say playing with a Ouija board, just uh, to most people a relatively innocent thing because they're sold at Sears and Roebuck and Montgomery Wards. Uh, when they get involved in any form of the occult, then they open a door to oppression, and even worse, if uh, depending on a lot of factors, individual and a lot of other conditions and circumstances and factors, at least so to be oppressed by these forces of darkness. And many times people have ailments they can't get healed of. They have problems that they can't handle or get rid of. Uh, they have situations, deceptions in their minds, attitudes that, uh, that others can see are not of God or not scriptural uh, because spirits are at work in their lives, in their bodies, in their minds, and so on. And you take a person who has a congenital weakness uh, like asthma and it never comes forth, you see, uh, some hereditary congenital problem, and then he or she visits a fortune teller or dabbles with the Ouija board or something of this nature, and then that thing that was just latent, a congenital weakness, it was just in the genes, you see, then comes forth because they've opened a door for this spiritual entity, this spirit of infirmity, to begin to manifest itself uh, in that person, in this case a physical infirmity, where if they'd never dabbled in the occult, it, it would have never happened. That is, it was just a latent thing, a weakness in the, in the ancestry. Uh, this is a quite common thing, that people suddenly have problems. They don't know why they've got them. Physical, mental, spiritual, marital, domestic, business, all kinds of problems. And when they come to us and they begin to talk to us about these things, they don't understand them. We'll point them to some contact they've made with an occult spirit. 
Uh, they've studied Rosicrucianism. They have visited a Jehovah's Witness meeting to see what it's all about, or they're running around with somebody who's a member of a cult, a boy or a girl who's running around with a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or somebody who's involved in unity and that sort of thing. And problems begin to happen in their life and they don't see the connections until we show them from the Word of God and from our experience uh, in dealing with so many along this line that Involvement in any form of the occult, whether it's innocent or otherwise, opens a door to oppression. There are religious spirits, deceiving spirits, spirits that will uh, have you eating certain kinds of food or not eating certain kinds of food or dressing a certain way or, or uh, deceive you concerning some doctrine or attitude or idea. There are spirits that work on the emotions and a person becomes obsessed with jealousy or envy or hate or resentment. Uh, I, I look out as I minister and I see people and I'm not necessarily as I say always talking to the group that I'm talking to when I say this but I, as, I, as we minister we see people who as you look at them you can tell they hate your very sight and they've never seen you before and they don't know what's happening between them and the Holy Spirit in me, that spirit in them, you see, is directing this hate and resentment toward the Word of God and the Holy Spirit that's within me. Well, it would be you if you were up here. It doesn't matter who's up here. And uh, many times, you see, people have bondages and need deliverances in areas that they know nothing about because somewhere along the line they've gotten involved in the occult. And uh, as I often say, uh, don't eliminate yourself until you hear all we have to say because about 10 out of 10 people need deliverance. Used to say, used to say 9 out of 10, but that always gave that, uh, always gave everybody the escape, door of escape. They said, well, I'm the 10th one because I've never been involved. But it's really true that we're not trying to manufacture some problems or rather causes for your problems in your life. But we have found that if the person hasn't had direct contact with the occult, it's in the family somewhere, and that's sufficient. We've seen wonderful deliverances uh, happen to people who were not directly involved in the occult, but it came through another source, like an uncle, a cousin, a grandmother, a card reader, that sort of thing, uh, where they had the spirits, the demons, and they do pass off to the children. That may not be acceptable to everybody's understanding or our uh, spirit to say a thing like that but we're just uh, we're living in such a time we have to tell it like it is babies are born in the world needing deliverance uh, uh, I've never now I, there can be an exception to this statement but I haven't found it yet I've never seen an adopted child that didn't need deliverance always without exception uh, they're experiencing generally great problems with adopted children and there are reasons for that because they've come out of an adulterous relationship somebody didn't want a child or the people were involved in the occult, or all sorts of reasons. And don't feel badly about that. If you've wondered what's, what, been wondering what's the matter with your adopted child, uh, just pray for the child's deliverance in faith in Jesus' name. You'll see a great change. We, we deal with this. We've dealt with this so many times. Uh, so we're, what we're talking about is a reality where these entities, spirits, demons, as the Bible speaks of them, uh, identify with the individual's physical problem or need or mental state or attitude or his own character and desire and they bury themselves in the structure of, of one's personality so that you can't identify them directly unless uh, they're pulling their hair out and biting uh, the uh, back of the chair in two or something like that then you say well they must have a demon but there are <laughs> Satan is much more subtle than that. He's said by Paul to be very wily and that we have to put on the whole armor of God. We have to be taught. We have to be instructed. We have to have our eyes open. We need discernment. We need the supernatural gifts of the Spirit uh, for this. Uh, but uh, everyone's not going to have that. Everyone isn't going to have the gift of discernings of spirits, but everyone can discern spirits. Uh, there's a difference, you see. You can discern the presence and activity of spirits. So they try, as I say, to bury themselves and hide themselves within the context of your personality, your life, your temperament, your makeup. And that's why it's very hard for the average doctor, psychiatrist, minister, Christian, and many charismatics to, to uh, be aware of the presence and activity of spirits because they don't know how to look for them. They don't know what to look for. They don't know what to see. 
Uh, just like on our trip, I said to my wife, and I don't go around doing this, but I said just to show you what I mean, uh, when you get an opportunity, don't stare, but look in that girl's eyes and you'll see what I see when I so often see people who need deliverance badly and a demon is looking out at me. <laughs> and she could see it if you know what to look for. Now, it's all in the book. We've got hundreds of characteristics, how you can tell when a person needs deliverance. Uh, it isn't that you go around looking in people's eyes or <laughs> looking for people who need deliverance, but you see as a charismatic, there are many people who come to you and you're constantly dealing with people who need help and you're not going to be able to help them fully unless you know how to discern uh, how these things work and how they operate. And it's strange to me why some people can't see more than they do uh, out of other individuals as being demonic in its source. But you will find that if you will get into the Word of God and you'll get into a book like this, Angels of Light, and we took the title from that passage in 2 Corinthians 11 where Satan is said to appear as an angel of light. If you'll get into something like this and study, God will begin to show you things that are causing problems in the lives of people that will astound you that it's not just some psychological thing our habit our addiction our attitude of mind at all but it's a spirit if you'll deal directly with that spirit I don't care what you you can call it a spirit of nicotine if they can't give up their cigarettes and you can get people free from the cigarette habit because you were willing to deal with us with a demon of nicotine amen You'd be surprised what some of these things are. I know I have a friend, Dr. Ware, down in Kokomo, Indiana, and uh, we have, uh, oh, we've been together several times. One time <clears throat> uh, we were somewhere together, and he was telling me about how he got convinced about this. He's a medical doctor. And he'd received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he said he was up at St. Louis at the International Full Gospel Businessmen's uh, uh, Yearly Convention up there, and... Uh, not that he was doubting things, but he had not seen uh, uh, anything really, like a healing and all, and all the healings were taking place inside where he couldn't see them. So they just called him up, uh, uh, some of those there who knew him, and said, now here's a woman, look at this lip, all swollen out, it was great, bug way out, you see, and said, now you pray for her, and watch what happens. He said he laid his hands on her and prayed for her, and just watched that go down before his eyes. <laughs> And then he said he, he heard, I think it was Derek Prince there praying for people, and he was casting out all kinds of spirits, some that were really weird-sounding things, you know, that people snicker and laugh at. And he said when he, when he called to a spirit of nicotine in this man or woman who it was to come out, a spirit of nicotine, and he'd never heard anything like that in his life. Spirit of nicotine, demon of nicotine. But he said the thing went right by him. <laughs> Where he was, wherever he was, he says, came right by him. He smelt it go, come and go and leave. Amen. <laughs> that convinced him of the reality of some of these things. You see, these spirits, they have lusts and appetites, just like people do. And whatever your lust or appetite is, if you prevail in it, persist in it long enough, then a spirit will take possession of you. And be, that will become a, a chronic condition that you couldn't get rid of in a thousand years by prayer or by uh, will, willpower, or anything else. It has to be dealt with directly as a spirit. Well, there are many ways, of course, uh, many ways in which a person can get oppressed or possessed by spirits, whether we're talking about Christians or non-Christians or charismatics or non-charismatics. Uh, many, many ways, emotional crises and sin and lust and resentment and serious illness and accidents, uh, resistance to the Word of God or some form of truth because it isn't what you've been taught or you don't particularly want to adapt your lifestyle, spiritual lifestyle to what you're hearing, uh, the occult, just many, many ways in which participation, involvement in things or things happening to you can open the door to oppression by spirits. Emotional crises, like one woman that I dealt with several years ago, uh, her problem started through a traumatic experience where she said that she threw a ball <clears throat> as a child, and I think she was about three years old, and hit the baby in the head with a rubber ball and killed the baby. And said, that, that, that experience was bad enough, said her mother from that time blamed her for it and always would hold it before her. And that opened the door to spirits. That, that caused that woman to have many, many problems. And 
Uh, it's a long story. She got her deliverance, uh, but it's a long story. In mental institutions and sit in rooms morose and depressed and have thoughts of self-destruction with the shades drawn and all of that, you see. As a result of just uh, a spirit uh, uh, entering her as a child. And this often happens where children can witness the death of parents in an automobile accident and through some traumatic experience, uh, being sent off to the army is enough to some people to open spirit, uh, the door to spirits. That's right, I know of cases. Especially one young man, he, he lived a sheltered life. He belonged to a religious group that uh, they probably didn't go 50 miles away from home all their lives. Drafted and just the thought of being sent off to Vietnam or somewhere. In fact, he told me this personally. He lost his mind, lost his sanity as a result of that. Of course, God later delivered him, baptized him in the Holy Spirit and all. But uh, through that traumatic experience, you see. And the, this is just an innocent opening oneself through fear or some crisis. And people who are knowledgeable in the occult or in the area of deliverance know these things happen. And it's foolish to sit around and say a child couldn't get possessed or couldn't be oppressed and a Christian couldn't be oppressed or possessed because we deal with the people and the children and the Christians who are oppressed and possessed by these spirits. And so it's just uh, hiding your head in the sand to say it can't happen. Well, of course, people who say that can't really help these individuals at all. There's no way to help a person if you don't believe that, uh, that Satan is, is uh, able to do many things that many Christians don't think he is able to do or isn't doing. And through sin, through lust, through resentment, through drug, alcohol addiction, like one druggist that I was counseling with began to take his own drugs. And by his own testimony, he said, I've had, he just said, I've had uh, hundreds of spirits cast out of me as a result of that. He was free then, of course, but he was telling about the drug addiction had opened the door to the possession by these spirits. And serious accident and illness. Uh, hospitals are the worst place in the world to be in time of sickness because spirits of all sorts are there. Spirits of infirmity, spirits of death, fear, uh, can actually possess people and do invade them. There's, uh, there's a whole area here that could be uh, written about, which is real, uh, where a person through fear can open himself to a spirit of infirmity. I heard somebody uh, on a tape, or telling of this directly, I forget which, how that when an individual died with a certain disease, the person in the next bed was afraid of, of contracting that and took it immediately. The spirit went from that person's spirit of infirmity at death to the other. Uh, we're dealing with an area that uh, is very little known in the church today. Very little knowledge about it. And what knowledge there is, charismatics have it. And not too many charismatics have a whole lot of knowledge. If you know anything at all about this area, though, you know more, most than most Christians. It's like Hebrew. If you know a little Hebrew, you know more than anybody. <clears throat> Yeah, it's that hard. Praise the Lord. But uh, <clears throat> we're dealing with, with a subject that needs a lot of study on your part so that you can help people. I've got no hang-ups, no hassle in this area. When people say, now listen, I've got a story to tell you that I know you've never heard anything like this in your life. I say, I doubt you can tell me anything I haven't heard <laughs> along this line. And it's a rare thing to hear anything new. Uh, a little different twist to the same old story of how they're oppressed and why. And so we need to delve into this area. That's we, I mean, you need to delve into this area and to learn just how people are being invaded and oppressed by these spiritual entities. Resistance to the truth uh, is one of the easiest way I, ways I know to come under bondage to Satan. Resistance to any form of truth that God has set forth in his word. We should not sit out there, sit on our little thrones, uh, and I'm talking to all of us, and sit in judgment upon God's servants, Amen. thinking that we've got more light than they have or that they're wrong all the time. Now, I'm talking uh, always along this line in an ideal situation, uh, not where there's obvious error being taught, where the person is non-charismatic or unenlightened and that sort of thing. But we should not do this because we have the most to lose. And what can happen? And I'm talking to myself, you see. I learned, I learned a long time ago that God 
And God has said this to me. I don't mean directly, but he said it to me through another person that he said it to directly. Who are you to judge another man's servant? And that's helped me many, many times keep from judging people who were wrong. Now, I didn't say in heresy or error, but wrong, where you knew they were wrong, from the Word of God. And uh, I'll let this brother tell his own testimony, but he said he was really taking this fellow up and down, you know, uh, criticizing because he was wrong. And he said the Lord Jesus Christ spoke directly to him in the wall of a voice and said, Who are you to judge my servant? He was criticizing another minister. Well, he said, Lord, you know he's wrong. He said, I said, who are you to judge my servant? Well, I'll tell you, friends. Uh, if you could get to the place where you would stop criticizing me, some of you, you would automatically get set free of some of your problems. Now, I say that in love, but uh, it's a good context to say it in. Do you think that I stand up here and don't know some of the things and attitudes and problems that you have with some of the strong meat that comes forth from this pulpit. I mean, God doesn't put dummies in the pulpit. God doesn't. But I'll, I'll tell you something else. He doesn't put people in the pulpit that are affected by people. Who thinks he puts dummies in the pulpit? <laughs> you cannot let the people get to you. And I'm not implying there's a segment of opposition out there and all that. No, we've got a beautiful relationship in this body. But I'm not dumb. And if you learn the lesson that I've learned, all of you, whether it's here or wherever you go, as you hear the word of God coming forth, don't sit in judgment on the word. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. If it is not what God is saying, the Spirit within you will witness that and pray for the man, pray for the woman, pray for me, pray for your brother, pray for your sister. You'll get a lot more accomplished that way. And so criticism doesn't hurt the person. It hurts you and it opens the door to a spirit that will oppress, evade, invade, and possess your mind. Your attitudes will be warped by satanic forces. Look what happened to King Saul. Saul, in his rebellion, uh, was allowed, God allowed him to be possessed by an evil spirit. First Kings 16 tells us this precisely. God sent an evil spirit. And Paul, uh, Saul became uh, 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 oppressed with a, an infirm, insane spirit. Spirits of insanity. And David would have to play the harp, you know, to soothe, soothe the king. And I've dealt with people, I dealt with a young one man that when I was dealing with the occult, not this particular aspect of it, but I was teaching along that line, one young man who opposed it, later found out he was wrong, came and admitted he was wrong and wanted what we had, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's, he was opposing that as, as, as well as the fact that involving yourself in fortune telling or the Ouija board and so forth could open the door to the powers of darkness to oppress you. He opposed that. Six months later came and admitted his error, won the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and couldn't receive it. Why? Because through his opposition to this message and the Holy Spirit, he had come to the place where he was possessed with a spirit of unbelief. He wanted to believe and said, I can't. Now, that's a pretty sad state to be in. Well, praise God. If you have faith and know who Jesus Christ is and who you are, that you're a son of God and that he has given you the victory, then you don't have to turn a person away like that and say there's no help or no hope. So we battled those spirits for an hour and a half, and he got free, and he received the Holy Spirit, and he did believe it, and he spoke in tongues, and he went away rejoicing and ended up uh, uh, teaching in a Pentecostal school, not even believing six months prior to that that all of this was real. So... But the point is, uh, if we had not been willing to move in there by faith and battle the forces of darkness for an hour and a half, uh, he would have not been free. I'm saying that you can get so bound through skepticism and resistance to the Word of God and many times think you're doing it in the name of Christianity that you can get to the place where you call black, white, white, black, truth, error, and error, truth. You, don't, you can't discern the difference and distinguish the difference. God hasn't called you to judge or to criticize. He hasn't called me to judge or to criticize. You don't have to criticize the ministry or the word 
uh, that comes forth out of people, maybe they're not perfect. Maybe you've got more light in some area. Uh, some area. But pray for the person that you've got more light than he's got in that particular area about. Pray for him, and God will open his eyes. And as I said, I know it's repeating myself, we're not talking about obvious error and heresy and things that would mislead people. We're speaking about a lot of things uh, that are very obvious. If you'll just open your eyes and ears that you see going on all the time where people, uh, <clears throat> they've got this pet idea, pet doctrine, uh, baptized three times, one time, upside down, sprinkled, pour. You can get so wrapped up in this that you can't reach the people with the truth. And so we're talking about what is obvious, not heresy or error of a serious nature. And then there is the occult. Of course, this opens the door to the kind of oppression we're talking about tonight, like the woman who visited the seance uh, and then had marital problems for 13 years until we prayed for her deliverance from occult spirits. Uh, couldn't receive the baptism all of that time. Received the baptism of the Holy Spirit immediately after taking her through uh, two or three simple steps. We're talking about the man who had chronic back trouble. Why? Because he had dabbled in astrology. And as I say, no one sees the connections between these things until we begin to point them out to you. Like the woman with the migraine headaches who had visited the fortune teller who got delivered from the migraines when she confessed that as sin and dealt with it. As an occult matter, we're talking about this sort of thing. People who can't be healed, people who can't receive the baptism, people who uh, can't get rid of some problem, who are financially bound and can't seem ever to get to a place of uh, victory in this area. Many times it's because they've opened the door to oppressing spirits, or depressing spirits, or obsessing spirits, or possessing spirits, any and all kinds. Uh, through some occult involvement, uh, handwriting analysis, visits to the fortune teller, Ouija board, palm reading, <clears throat> magic charming, magic healing, hypnosis, false religious cults and their teachings, whatever uh, would be classified as occult. Sometimes it's just been innocent involvement. It's innocent as far as a person saying, well, I didn't know what was involved. Or <clears throat> as far as a person saying, I didn't really believe in it, but it happened. You know, I got oppressed. And so... Uh, uh, well, like the pastor's wife that we dealt with who had chronic asthma. She'd been magically charmed as a child for healing of that very condition. <clears throat> I asked her, I said to her, I said, were you healed actually when your, it was her father who charmed her, went through this magical ritual. And this is quite common practice right here in civilized North Webster. You can find magic charming going on. You don't have to go anywhere to find it. It's just around everywhere. Charmed her? She said, yes, that I was healed of asthma as a child. And she said, the house burned down that we lived in, and the house was charmed. The way the charm worked, it, it was involving the house. When the house burned down, her asthma came back. Chronic. Here she is, a woman, 50, 60, oh, I guess 60 years old. And we took her, showed her it was occult. That was occult, being magically charmed. And Satan, though he may heal, he may remove, that is, the oppressing spirit that was causing the asthma, uh, that when the charm was broken, then he came back and oppressed you worse. Or I said, anyway, you would have been oppressed in some other way. He always exacts his price, his wages, uh, that if he uh, tells a spirit of infirmity to loose the person because they've gone through some form of magical charming to get it done, then he will begin to oppress them mentally or psychically or in the spirit of some other way. And so we took her through the simple steps of deliverance from the occult, saw her several months later, as she passed the pulpit, she said, you remember that prayer for deliverance from the occult, the asthma? said, I've had no more asthma since that day. Amen. Oppression. See, this is a physical form of oppression. Innocent, really, from her standpoint, because this was done upon her as a child by parents who were involved in magic charming. Our depression, spirits of depression, these are spirits when it's a chronic thing. Now, anyone can wake up and see a rainy, cloudy day and allow himself to become depressed. We're not talking about you needing deliverance. If that uh, ever happened to you, just like a spirit of fear is not jumping when somebody lights a firecracker in back of you. <clears throat> that wouldn't mean you had a spirit of fear, but we're talking about where a person is obsessed with fright and fear and depression, this sort of thing. 
And like the two young ladies, for example, who went to the slumber party, instead of slumbering, they had the seance. And so from that day, this girl, uh, this was reported by one who participated in it, said they uh, almost did not uh, bring the one who was acting as the medium out of the trance, and that scared her off of doing it anymore. But said two of the girls who participated in that said from that day, one of them uh, is a cr has chronic melancholia, depressive, sits around and cries and weeps all the time. A complete personality change. Well, this is a spirit that's invaded her. Said the other girl has a spirit of lust, has gone, a Christian girl, said now she's just out living quite loosely in sin uh, from the result of participation in the seance. But here's a spirit of depression, you see, that possessed this young girl as a result of some uh, little innocent party, you know, calling on the spirits and all that has become quite common and popular today. Or obsessions, being obsessed with the idea that you can't sleep without a light or that you can't eat certain foods. Uh, I'm afraid there are a lot of people possessed or obsessed with that uh, spirit. They can't eat certain things, foods high in cholesterol or pork and what have you. Not knowing the first Timothy 4 says plainly this is a demon when you believe this sort of thing. That all food is cleansed by prayer in your thanksgiving. It's cleansed. It will not hurt you. That in the latter days some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to these seducing spirits and the doctrines of demons, forbidding to marry and forbidding to eat meats, and so on. Right in the word of God tells us that such is a spirit deceiving the individual, but obsessed with this idea, obsessed with the idea that they can't walk up steps, they have to ride an elevator, they can't get on an elevator, they have to walk up steps, or they have to walk on all the odd steps or all the even steps. Uh, you uh, live to be 30 years of age and you'll see people with these obsessions washing the doorknobs so they won't get germs. Uh, I mean like every day. It's all right to wash the doorknobs if they're dirty, but washing them every day and wearing gloves uh, when you eat out in a restaurant. Of course, you knew what was some of the things served you, you might want to wear gloves if you didn't have faith, but... Uh, <laughs> Obsessions walking on the, the lines in the sidewalk. Have you ever seen anyone go down and have to step on every line? <laughs> now, you would never do that. <laughs> You've never done that, have you? I can tell by the way you... I can tell by the fact you're so quiet, you have. <laughs> or that you won't step on the lines. Well, we've all done that as children. But that is, that is not an obsession if you've just done it, you know, to humor yourself or because it was a little game you were playing. But if you... Find that you have to do that all the time. That's an obsession. Or if you walked on all the lines or think you have, and you go home, you get home, and get undressed and get in bed, and about an hour later, you're awakened suddenly. You get dressed and go back out five miles down the sidewalk. Somewhere there, you know you missed a line. You go back <laughs> stepping. That's an, obs that's an obsession. Used to know, I knew of a young man that couldn't sleep, uh, could, not, could not be alone. He had to be with somebody all the time. Had, had a talking demon. Had talk all the time. You know any of those people have talk all the time? Some of them, I'm sure, have talking spirits. Uh, I've run into some of them. Uh, you know, I found that uh, people who talk all the time either have a spirit or they're always in trouble because if you talk all the time, ultimately, eventually, you're going to say the wrong thing. <laughs> That's right. And time and time again, I've said to myself about, you know, a person that's just talking all the time, then they let slip. They've said the wrong thing. I said, well, they should have quit while they were ahead. They should have shut up about an hour ago. But some, some people have to, an obsession to talk. So spirits can obsess and, and oppress and depress and possess. And it's a popular misconception to think that a Christian cannot be oppressed or possessed because the facts, now logic may tell you to the contrary, but facts speak just the opposite, that a Christian can be oppressed. You see in Acts 10, 38, that all sickness is oppression from Satan. For God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, and he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. All right, I'll ask you one question. Do you suppose Jesus ever healed a believer? If he healed one, 
then Christians can be oppressed of the devil because Acts 10.38 says all sickness is an oppression of the devil. And certainly he healed believers. Most of the people that he healed were believers. In fact, I, uh, you could say all of them, for all practical purposes, were believers that he was delivering from the devil's oppression. And in Luke 13, the woman that Jesus said is bound by the devil, he says she has a spirit of infirmity. Bound by a spirit of infirmity, he said she is a daughter of Abraham. Abraham and has been bound for these 18 years. We read, of course, in Job chapters 1 and 2 that all of his oppression, his adversity, was at the hands of Satan. Satan caused this. 1 Timothy 4 that we quoted you, in the latter days some shall depart from the faith. What faith? Christian faith. They will depart from the Christian faith. Why? Because they were not careful. They gave heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of demons. And some of those doctrines are forbidding to marry and forbidding the eating of meats. Paul says this is a seduction of a demon, a seducing spirit, deceiving spirit. And some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. And so if that isn't oppression of the devil, I don't know what you'd call it when a person departs from the faith. That's the worst kind of oppression that I could think of. And he's talking to Christians. He says, so you would be careful, be on your guard. Oh, it isn't that you have to run around looking under every rock and behind every bush and being in fear of the devil. We're not saying that, not teaching that, but we're saying what the Word of God says. That we have to be careful that Satan appears as an angel of light and he's very subtle and he works through the Word of God many times, quotes it, I've heard the devil quote the word of God through people time and time again. He quoted it to Jesus. If thou be the son of God, cast yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. He said, for the scripture says, he shall give his angels charge over thee. They'll keep thee in all thy ways. They'll bear thee up in their hands, up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Quoting the psalm we read this morning, Psalm 91. Quoted it to Jesus. The devil knows how to use scripture. Seducing spirits at work. And they can deceive and are deceiving, and that's why if we get into the Word of God, we'll find that Satan can hinder and bind and oppress the people of God. If he could bind Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, he says, I am being, I have a thorn in the flesh. Now, we're not getting into what it was. We've got a tape on Paul's thorn, Job's boys, boils, Epaphroditus' sicknesses. And if you want to know what it was, we deal with what it is on that tape. But the point is, Paul himself said, I am oppressed by a messenger. An angel literally said, I'm oppressed by an angel of Satan. The apostle said that. He said in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 17 and 18, that many times he says, I tried to get to Thessalonica, I tried to get there to, to minister to you, but he said, I couldn't because Satan hindered me. He said, I am being hindered by Satan. I wonder if we're, can you give me a little more volume back there? I think I'm too low back there. I'm not getting anything out here. A little more volume on that. And so if the Apostle Paul can say that he can be hindered, then certainly, certainly, uh, there's no Christian sitting out there tonight that could say that he's immune to such hindrance or oppression. Paul wasn't careless, and he was hindered, and he was oppressed. And so God forbid that we should be careless and indifferent to the deeper revelation that Christians can be bound and oppressed and need to be on their guard. I say deeper revelation because the church doesn't have that revelation today. They're teaching to the contrary. But the classic proof text that a Christian can be oppressed is from Jesus' own lips when he said in Mark chapter 7, when the Syrophoenician woman came to Jesus and asked for the deliverance of her daughter, he said, no, I've only been sent to the house of Israel. He said, deliverance is the children's bread. He said, it's not meat to take the children's bread and give it unto dogs. He said, deliverance is the children's bread. If you're a child of God, deliverance has been provided for you. And if you think you don't need it or somehow you don't believe that you might or could possibly need it, that in itself is proof of deception by the enemy. No person ought, ought ever to say anything contrary to what God says. If he gives a testimony here, the deliverance is our bread, I'm not too ashamed. I'm not ashamed to say that that's my bread. If I need that bread, I'll eat it. Praise God. If, been, if God thinks it necessary to provide it for me, then I'm going to accept it. 
and not argue with it, debate. I don't care whether the Baptists or the Pentecostals or the Catholics or the Lutherans or anyone else believes it or doesn't believe it. Uh, I believe it because God said it. Uh, I am reminding, uh, reminded of a testimony of a sister who is Pentecostal. As I say, uh, Pentecostals are notorious for teaching that Christians cannot have demons, and I'm not uh, debating them over the issue. Uh, all you have to do is get into the Word of God. All you have to do is deal with people, and you'll find out that Christians can not only be oppressed but possessed by spirits. Well, she was Pentecostal and a Pentecostal pastor's wife, following the typical teaching. And let me hasten to add, I have no criticism of Pentecostals. I stand here tonight baptizing the Holy Ghost because the Pentecostals got it first. So let's just say that, that it isn't criticism per se, but it's criticism of the great blindness on their part because I've had to deal with so many Pentecostals that don't believe. Do you realize that people have come all the way from southern Indiana and sat right there, come for deliverance because they've heard about <clears throat> this ministry or gotten a hold of the book Angels of Light and sit there and argue with you because they're Pentecostal that they couldn't have a demon and they've come for deliverance. <laughs> and have been prayed for for deliverance and have not been delivered and you show them the connection between their problems and the occult and they start giving you all sorts of proof texts why it couldn't be and you have to remind them that's why you've come all these miles and just a spirit of unbelief you can just see it written on their faces they can't handle it they've listened to the wrong teaching for so long they need deliverance and yet will not accept the fact that 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 they need deliverance don't try to figure it out. I never have. I've had people sit and uh, time and again come for deliverance. And as soon as you get off on this, that it is a, 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 a demon as a result of the occult, then they start giving all of these arguments. Well, I've been a Christian for 30 years, and uh, my visit to the fortune teller was 35 years ago, so how could I still be oppressed? And you, I say, well, you told me you were oppressed, and that's why you're here. Until you make the relationship, you see, they don't see the illogical position that they're taking. And so this Pentecostal pastor's wife, she said, I didn't believe any of this. Uh, not only a Christian, she said, I, I knew that a Christian could not have a demon. Besides that, she said, no one baptized in spirit could have another spirit because there'd be no room for them. You know, like demons take up space or something. Well, if that's your hang-up, if there's anyone here with a hang-up, demons do not take up space. Uh, the man with the legion, he had a legion of demons in him. And demons can swarm around like bees. I mean, they don't take up space. We're talking about the spiritual dimension where there is no time or space, you see. We're not talking about the physical dimension that you can see and feel and touch. And So you can't put another pulpit here while this one's here. But in that dimension, you could have a thousand here. You see, in the spiritual dimension, because there's no space involved. Mm -hmm. And so, um, <clears throat> she said, you know, that there wouldn't be any room for another spirit. So she was a Christian, Pentecostal, pastor's wife, and baptized in the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues, and all of that. But her friends knew something was wrong, because she said, said to me, said, all my life I was bound with a chronic spirit of fear. Said it was written all over my face. She said, even unsaved people, sinners would say, what's the matter with that woman? It was so obvious. They didn't know what was wrong, but they knew something was wrong with me. He said, I knew it couldn't be a demon, though I knew I was uh, obsessed with fear. He said, some friends of ours uh, one time visiting us, charismatics, just came right out, blurted it out, sister, you need deliverance. Will you let us pray for you? We love you. And of course that hurt her feelings, but her, she said, my husband sided in with him. And so, more to humor them than anything else, she let them pray for them, for her, for deliverance from a spirit of fear. And she said, just so I thought, of course, nothing happened, because how could I have a demon of fear, and there was no manifestation, and that sort of thing. And she said she went on to bed. I guess she took her hurt feelings, went on to bed. She said, two o'clock, I was awakened by a voice speaking in my head, saying, in 20 minutes, and she said, as I lay there trying to figure out what in the world in 20 minutes meant, she said, in 20 minutes I found out because I had to get up and go wretch, vomit, if you please. So that's often the way they come out. And she said, the first time I wretched, something came out of me talking, said, I'm a spirit of fear. The very thing she'd been 
obsessed with all of her life. Well, that wasn't enough, she said. Other things began to come out of me that I didn't know was there, like pride, resentment, naming themselves. They come out. Pentecostal, pastor's wife, baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaks in tongues just like you do, delivered of demons. I, I like to give that. Uh, we could give a lot of testimonies of Christians being delivered because 99% of the people I've dealt with are Christians. I like to give that because it's... It was told directly to me by a person who didn't believe it, like some of the people we deal with don't believe it. And I figure if anything's going to convince them, it's another Pentecostal, it's another charismatic, it's another spirit-filled person, it's another person who can talk in tongues better than they. <laughs> and not only Pentecostal, but a pastor's wife, who got convinced even though she didn't believe she was possessed with a spirit, because somebody else believed it, and God in his grace had mercy on her and delivered her. Hallelujah. Amen. I'll tell you, uh, if we are not afraid to face the truth, then, then someone else, you know, they'll say, well, all of my involvement was before I was a Christian. Now, how can I be oppressed after I'm a Christian? Well, I always say, just like you can be oppressed physically by an ailment that you acquired as a result of your uh, intemperance and sin before you were converted, like ulcers resulting from too much alcohol before you were saved, I say to people, now that you're saved, you were not auto, uh, uh, now that a person is saved who has the ulcers, he isn't automatically healed because he's saved. He has to deal with that. It's a case of healing, needing healing. Uh, or as so often is, spirits, blindness or deafness is a spirit. And to say that a Christian could not be possessed with a spirit is to say that those epileptic spirits, and often epilepsy is a spirit, not always, but usually, is to say then that there are no Christians who are epileptic, are deaf, are blind, which of course you know in itself is ridiculous because churches are filled with Christians who have infirm spirits. And yet they weren't delivered because they became a Christian. So you have to deal with that specifically. And so I point out to people who have this question or this problem that just as you have to deal with every need you've got specifically. So if you are oppressed as a result of occult involvement 15 years ago, 20 years ago, before you were a Christian, you still have to deal with that to get delivered from the oppression. We're not talking about your forgiveness, your salvation. We're talking about your physical need, your mental need, your domestic need, your oppression, your depression, whatever it is. We're talking about getting delivered from that, and you have to deal with that specifically as a matter of deliverance or occult. Or some people will say, well, now, it couldn't, uh, I know I need help, but it couldn't be what you say because I've never been involved in the occult. And uh, generally, you can trace it back to where the family, cousins, mother, father, uh, wife, husband, someone has been involved in the occult, and they have been hurt as a result of it. Now, how this works is a long story. It just happens. Uh, some of the worst cases of oppression that we've ever seen have been uh, with people who've had no direct occult involvement. It just happens. I say babies are born in the world many times needing deliverance. Uh, children get possessed for a lot of reasons. And uh, uh, you'll never be able to help some children, take them to all of the psychiatrists and uh, doctors and uh, counselors and so on that you want. Some children are not going to be helped until you deal with it as a spirit. We could tell you stories. We've had to deal with these situations where uh, they've just given up hope, even the doctors, where one case just recently called where the child, three years old, sits and pulls all of the hair out of his head. Doesn't want to do it. Hurts him. He's got a spirit, demon. Until you deal with the demon, he's going to, he's going to go through life bald if he lasts that long. And just goes into hysterics. Uh, at times, just uncontrollable, nothing you can do with it. Three years old. Unless you recognize the fact, and the, the people are involved in the occult. I pointed out directly what it was. Directly, told them over the phone uh, what the solution was, and what the problem, what the cause was. It's occult, you see. Well, the child is innocent, but the child is damaged because they've allowed a teacher with a, who is a false prophet to come into their home and teach in their home and by his presence. You see, spirits have gotten off of the false prophet onto the child. And they've never made the connection until I told the woman the connection. Sometimes you might wonder why they don't see it themselves. If I could tell you about that situation, it would, 
either embarrass you or curl your hair, I said to her, you mean you didn't know he was false? You know, from what she told me over the phone. I don't see, as I say, why some people can't see the obvious. But anyway, that's what we're for. That's what God is baptizing you in the Spirit for, so you can help all these people that can't see the obvious, if nothing else. But anyway, here's a child now is free because, you see, the connection has been made. So some of the worst cases have been innocent involvement, like uh, a young girl uh, in our church some years ago who was seen, being oppressed by demons, seeing them. She says, I see them. They come and torment. And I've had spirits try to attack me sexually and all that. That's a whole big section in our new book, the incubi and succubi experiences that are quite well known and documented right down through history and psychiatrists and psychologists today are kind of pulling their hair out because they don't know how to handle these kind of situations and don't know it's already shown in the Bible that such things happen that spirits can cohabit with human beings. It's already happens in the Word of God and it happens when I've dealt, I've dealt with at least five, six people myself who've been attacked by spirits sexually. And uh, they, they just can't believe it, but it happens. And know what their ministers, like one woman said, I don't dare go to my minister. You know where they'd end up, in an, in an insane asylum somewhere. But this girl was suffering that sort of thing and couldn't find any occult at all. She'd never involved in anything. Well, I said, there's something there, it has to be. Well, she said, and she didn't think this was anything, but I did because the least thing can be the answer. <clears throat> Uh, she said, when I was four years old, my mother took me with her to have a wart charmed off of her hand, off of her hand. She said, she just took me along. I said, that's it. I said, we'll deal with that. We'll confess it like it's your sin. We'll deal with that, and we'll close this door. And a year later, almost to the day, I called her into my study. I said, Has there been, have there been any more apparitions, oppression, attacks, or anything? She says, from that moment, said, whatever it was anyway, said, I felt it leave when you prayed. She said, just lift it off of me. She said, in that moment, there's never been another moment of trouble. And here's innocent involvement. So you can't uh, set up rules on this and say it can't happen because they haven't been playing with the Ouija board or they're too young to be oppressed or possessed with spirits. We're dealing with a realm <clears throat> that is too fantastic to talk about in some circles. Uh, it's beyond human comprehension, really, what's out there. God purposely doesn't open most of your eyes to show you. I, I don't think some people would make it if they knew what was opposing them. I've been charged with saying there are demons behind every rock and bush. And I always say I've never gotten up and teach, I've never gotten up and taught that there are demons behind, I believe there are demons behind every rock and bush and fence post. I've always said I have never taught that. Because if I taught what I believe, <laughs> you might hear me say something like there's probably a dozen behind every. <laughs> because that is literally true. There is an innumerable host, great innumerable hosts of the powers of darkness being sent forth in these last days, especially in these last days. All hell is being unleashed to wreck what's left of the human race and to bind and hinder Christians. And they, it, Satan is having a field day right in the church. One of the ways, of, as I've said, is to convince Christians that all of this really is, uh, doesn't happen, isn't happening, and that psychiatry and medicine and counseling and all of that can take care of the ills and needs of the Christians. But psychiatry cannot do it. You're wasting your time on a psychiatrist's couch if you've got some of these things that we've mentioned tonight. Uh, so many of the problems we find are the result of this because, you see, a person doesn't realize the danger they're in when they call on these powers, and that's why God in Deuteronomy 18 forbids any contact with these spirits in any way. They've got different names, some of them today, but the hypnotist and the astrologer and the... Uh, uh, necromancer, the uh, spiritualist medium, and so forth. All of these things are still with us today. Terms may be a little different, but there's still the abominations mentioned here in Deuteronomy 18. And what happens when a person makes a contact, like one woman who lost her baby 
uh, at three years of age and who said, I'm a Christian baptized in the Spirit, speak in tongues, I have absolutely no joy, no peace, no... I said, life to me is just one drab gray. Why? I said, because of occult involvement. And that's when I learned she had visited a fortune teller. I said, what did the fortune teller tell you? She said that my baby would die when it was three. I said, it did. It did, didn't it? She said, yes. And said, from that time, I've never had any peace or joy. And so what happens, you see, when a person makes a contact like that, they open the door to invasion or oppression by the powers of darkness, just like giving Satan a free pass of access into your life, your domestic affairs, your business, whatever, mind, body. And he has trespass rights. And until we deal with that as an occult situation, then he says, I still have trespass rights because that person invited me in. When they played with the Ouija board, I, Satan doesn't care why you play with the Ouija board. He says, when they played with the Ouija board and asked me for information from that, which is a form of divination or fortune telling, he said, I supplied them with the information. Now, whether you, they, the demon got through or not is beside the point. But he does answer. He answers most of the time to people who are, that he's trying to ensnare. And if you just stay with the Ouija board long enough, you'll get all the answers you can handle. And I don't recommend you do because even the spiritualists in, in England are trying to ban the Ouija board for sale to children because he said this is a dangerous device. The spiritualists, the people who use it. This is too dangerous for children to handle because it says you can call up. When you call up these powers, some are good and some are bad. That's the way that they uh, deal with the problem of a lot of people getting hurt because they said you can get burned and burned badly when you play with a Ouija board. And the spiritualists realize the danger. And so when, when you've called on Satan, you've asked for the information, he gives it to you, but whether he does or not is beside the point. He, from that moment, has trespass rights upon your life. And let me tell you, he always exacts his price and his wages. Uh, whatever he gives you or whether or not you actually think you've gotten it is beside the point. Once you make the contact with the occult spirit, then you're involved. You are under some form of oppression. Whether or not you recognize it does not mean that we could not. In fact, I'll tell you, dear friends, I could talk to anybody long enough and point out the connection between their problem and some occult involvement. It's just that common. That's how common it is, is what I'm saying. Uh, it's, there's just no such thing like the woman from London that we met in Miami that couldn't receive the baptism, seeking it for years. I said, it's occult. I always start there. I don't care what people think. I just start there. So it's occult. Oh, I never did anything like that in my life. I know it's wrong. Never got involved in spiritualism and all that. Oh, she said, I'm quite a famous writer of ghost stories. <laughs> Now, would you, have, would you in a thousand years make a connection between writing? She had a, a, an award, you know, that from, the, uh, from the government because she was so well known. She said, I visit all these old castles and get the setting and get in the mood and write my stories. I said, would you believe the very fact that you're, that is a form of occult, you see? I said, would you believe there's a connection between that and the fact you can't receive the baptism? We took her through these two simple steps I'm going to tell you, and she immediately immediately received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues. And I mean to tell you, the power of God hit her from head to toe. Just like she said, my wife was there. It was in our hotel room in Miami, Florida. She said, it was just like a charge of electricity went through her. I don't go by feeling, but I'll tell you when it's there, I'm always uh, happy that a person, <laughs> that a person, you know, got some physical evidence too. Because if they haven't been taught anything about faith, they don't know how to take the appropriate promises of God by faith. Some people don't think they have anything. But it really hit her. Uh, you see, but here is, is an occult contact. And so many ways, and so, so many subtle ways in which Satan can ensnare an individual because you're calling on him. When you're involved in the occult in any farm, <clears throat> innocent or otherwise, you're calling on him. This opens the door to oppression. Now, God in his word, Deuteronomy 18, forbids it for that reason, because you're calling on the other God, the God of this world, Satan. And to God, that's the worst kind of sin you can commit because that makes you unclean. That is the worst kind outside apostasy, aside from apostasy. Because that makes you spiritually unclean. Satan is the unclean spirit. To dabble with the occult uh, in any way, for any reason, makes you to be having intercourse and fellowship with the unclean spirits. 
And so what happens in such a case, then God uh, has set forth in his word the fact that it is such an abomination that the curse of that thing, he says, can go off to the third and fourth generation. And often some of the strongest mediums and the people who need deliverance the worst are third and fourth generation children of people whose uh, great-grandparents or something were involved in the occult. And uh, in Deuteronomy 29, 29, God says, I don't want you dealing into the secret things. He says, the secret things belong to me. He said, the things that I reveal belong to you. Deuteronomy 29, 29. In James chapter 1, he says, does any of you lack wisdom? Go ask the fortune teller what decision you should make, uh, what you should do about your future. Should you sell or should you hold on a little longer? Should you get married or not get married? Ask the Ouija board, seek the astrologers. What does God say? If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, Amen. who giveth to all. the Ouija board, seek this. Astrologers, what does God say? If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, Amen. who giveth to all men liberally, who upbraideth not. Amen. God will give you the wisdom you need. He will help you make the decisions. But it's an abomination to God for us to call on any other source. As we see in Galatians 5 and Revelation 21, that they who do these things, God says, the sorcerers have their part in the lake of fire. Now, God does not tell you these things. As our brother said, Jesus is our friend. And he doesn't tell you these things to get you upset or afraid or to cause you to, uh, to lose your joy or whatever. But he's telling you this to enlighten you because he's provided a way by which you can close the door and free yourself of these spirits or this form of oppression, whatever it may be. He doesn't make it hard. He enables us through two simple steps as Christians to close the door on these powers forever so they cannot operate in our lives as Christians and hinder the work of God or damage your faith or in any way oppress you as a result of occult participation. Of course, you have to keep the door closed, but that's obvious about anything. And the first step is to confess any known contacts that we've made. The Ouija board, involvement in Eastern religions, transcendental meditation, yoga, hypnosis, fortune telling, whatever it may be, whatever you can remember, to confess that as sin in Jesus' name and say, I'm putting that under the blood. Or you can say, if it pleases you better, I believe it's under the blood. In Jesus' name, I'm acknowledging that that is the cause of my oppression because of that occult involvement. The second step is then for you to command Satan. This is your command because you opened the door. Then you must close it to command Satan to release you as a result of your occult participation. And if you do that in faith, there isn't a demon in hell that can bind or oppress you as a result of this. Now, I'm talking about doing something in faith. I'm not talking about waiting for a feeling to see if I got... Uh, release or if my healing is manifested right away or something of this nature. Although this has happened in our meetings where we've taught sometimes hundreds along this line, as high as 1,200 at once, we've had people come and say, as I was going through this, making this confession, commanding Satan to release me as a result of my occult involvement, uh, uh, a growth here that I'd been trying to get a manifestation of healing for years disappeared or I felt this oppression leave me, and this sort of thing. So as one young lad, 12 years old, uh, got his hang up on the monster and horror shows on TV, his mother said, all he does now is sit around and draw monsters. So it's real weird. He used to draw daisies and flowers. I said he picked it up on TV. When he went through this with us, and he said, and he didn't know anything about demons or demons leaving or what it felt like, and, and he, he confided after he went through this, he said, he said, that demon just, he said, I felt it leave me. He knew what it was, it left. He didn't know what he had until we told him, but he knew what it was when it left. And so this sometimes happens. I've heard Don Basham, I read it in his book, uh, he teaches on the occult, and they do use our book. I just say that in passing. The Lord is really blessing that. Uh, Logos, who prints it now for us, 
uh, it, it is listed among the books that have sold over a quarter of a million. Now, we ourselves have sold many, many, many thousands of these ourselves. And that's just what they have sold, over 200,000 of this book. And we just praise God for that. And it's being translated, it's in the process now, being translated into the Spanish. So it's going all over, all over South America, Cuba, the Spanish-speaking world. And so uh, there are times when people, you know, have gotten a hold of this book and told us about it and how that God has helped them through it. If, um, if you'd like to stand now, I would, I would like to <clears throat> encourage all of us who have never been through this to just, in faith, believe that what we've said is the way it is because out of the Word of God and out of our experience we've set forth, I don't know, about a hundred pages there of proof to you when you've got time you can read it of the fact that this is the root cause of many of the problems you have and people you know that have and you'll never be able to help some of your loved ones and friends until you can take them through this, through these two simple steps. We're assuming a person is in Christ. Faith in Christ is the basis. We're talking to Christians. If you're not a Christian, then you come after and we uh, will lead you uh, as your heart desires in a confession of faith in Christ because that becomes the basis of deliverance. But I'm assuming everyone here is a Christian. Some of you have already been through this. Some of you have not. So God, and some of you are not like new here that have never been through this. So in faith, let's go through this together. And those of you who have already been through it, you just believe with us that those who have not Amen. gone through the two steps of deliverance are going to be set free tonight. Amen. You're going to find that things that were in your life, hang-ups, hindrances, problems, obsessions, these things can now be dealt with by you in victory. Uh, I wish I could say more about some of the things I know about some of you that I don't think that, that, that you would, would uh, have some attitudes and so forth that you have or say some of the things you do if in faith you'll go through this. And I don't really care at this point if you say I've been through it, if you'll go through it now by faith. I've taken people through it who have been through it and they got delivered when I took them through it. It isn't because it... Uh, well, after all, I wrote the book, but it isn't because I wrote the book that makes a difference, but sometimes it's the stress that I put at the right place that's made the difference. Amen. God. Especially in that second step, you say, occult, the devil's listening. You better believe it. Amen. If you just say, take your hands off me, he won't take his hands off you. That is, uh, he won't if he hasn't already. You can tell him that about some things, but if it's occult, you better say occult. And that's what we're dealing with tonight. And so let's just bow our heads together and then in faith you begin to confess to God all of the known contacts that you've made or that your family's made. If you don't know of any in your life, if you know it's in your family, uh, spiritualism or playing with the Ouija board, hypnosis, Eastern religions, yoga, transcendental med meditation, Mormonism, the cults, anything that you think of, you just say, Father, I confess these things as sin and put them under the blood in Jesus' name. I believe they're under the blood in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You see what this does? It brings us out in the open where you're bringing out in the open where the devil has had you bound because of some occult contact somewhere in your life. Just believe it. Believe that it's under the blood. You don't have to remember all things, just what comes to mind right now. You only have to do this once. You don't have to go through it again if you remember something tomorrow that you forgot to mention. In fact, I would just encourage you to say, Lord, if I've forgotten anything of an occult nature, I put that under the blood of Jesus also. Anything I may have forgotten, I put every bit of occult involvement by faith under the blood of Jesus. I believe I am forgiven in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. You believe. You believe now that that is removed, that that is under the blood. Don't get in any theological debates with yourself at this point. Just 
know that you've recognized the cause of your problems, or some of your problems at least, that they're under the blood. You've had them pointed out. God has enlightened your mind to that fact tonight. They're under the blood of Jesus. And now in Jesus' name, let's go, and you ought to do this vocally, you ought to do it audibly, against the enemy. I command you, Satan, to release me from all oppression, in mind, body, soul, and spirit, or of any other nature, as a result of my occult involvement, or any occult involvement in my family history. I command you to release me from every form of oppression. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And I believe that I am free. That I am liberated from all occult oppression. All our call oppression in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. believe that that did it. Amen. 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 Well, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Now, don't you go by feeling, but if anything has happened, why, just tell us about it. If you know it happened right now. Because often it does. A healing, a release. What's back here? I saw a wall, a guy was climbing over it. Praise the Lord. Well, did you all hear that? Well, it's, we were rebuking and commanding Satan, going through this deliverance, he saw, the Lord showed him, a prison wall and a man climbing over it and escaping. Well, that's every one of you who will appropriate it by faith. He's setting you free. He's bringing you out of prison. It's the word of God that sets us free. And you've heard the word. The word will set you free. Faith comes by hearing the word. You've heard the word. You ought to have faith for being free. And don't say I'm not free because I don't feel it. Say I'm free because God said it. Amen. Amen. If the Son shall make you free, then you're free indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, do you confess what you believe you possess and you'll possess it. Amen. God bless you.